Well, good evening. It's another uh, Wednesday night here uh, in the uh, Ham Class uh, Studio Control Room. Uh, glad to have you along. This is the uh, Amateur Radio Ham Radio uh, Technician Licensing Class. Uh, my name's uh, Gary, uh, Ham Radio Call Sign W4EEY, or as Hams would say, Whiskey 4 Echo Echo Yankee. And uh, tonight we're going to be uh, covering Chapter 8, uh, Licensing Regulations. And when I say Chapter 8, I have to grab the book for those who might be watching on uh, YouTube. Uh, this is the book we're talking about, the uh, Ham Radio License Manual from the American Radio Relay League. Uh, this is the current uh, book uh, with the red cover. Uh, and uh, in the series here, we uh, try to teach everyone all they need to know in order to get their first amateur radio license in the United States. And to start things off, I'd uh, like to move over to Zoom and uh, congratulate uh, Jeff Parker, who uh, tested early this last Saturday here in the Greenville, South Carolina area, and he passed. Uh, Jeff, would you take a few moments and uh, unmute uh, and uh, tell us about the experience? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, first of all, I want to say the, the reason, one of the reasons I went ahead and tested early is I wasn't, you know, trying to hot dog or anything. I'm just concerned about the virus situation and, you know, them shutting everything down again. And as much as I'd studied, I wanted to go ahead and test when everything was fresh on my mind, basically. Uh, <clears throat> it, it, was, it was neat. I mean, we tested here at the Red Cross facility and um, it's like Gary had told us, you know, you, you go in and sit down and there's three examiners in there and they, they give you a test and um, um, they grade it and everything while you're there. So when you leave, you, you know whether you passed or failed. Um, one thing I would tell you, um, and I don't know what it would be like for any of y'all go and test, but it was kind of noisy. Um, that some of the other hams showed up that was friends with the examiners and they were standing around talking and it, it was kind of hard to concentrate to be honest with you that was the only really negative um, thing I would have to say about the experience um, I I had to take I'm a cancer patient a lot of y'all know that and I had to take chemo that Friday afternoon so I got up on Saturday morning and went and took the ham exam which I wouldn't recommend that to too many people, but um, that was kind of tough by itself. But if I go back and take it again, I'm just going to take me a set of earplugs. I think that would be a, a, a good way to kind of tone it out and, uh, you know, and um, be able to concentrate a little better. But I, the one thing I would say is study, 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 and take advantage of um, of the, the AA, I mean, the ARRL. Um, test the pre-test, um, take those tests and take them over and over before you go because the, the test questions that Gary's showing us are they're on the test I promise you they're there and if you learn those test questions um, you'll do okay and, and listen to what he's telling you because every bit of it is on the test. And, and Jeff do you want to share your score? Well, I wasn't going to with everybody, but it, it, since you brought it up, I mean, I made a hundred on it. So, well, I'll, congratulations, I'll Jeff! Very I proud of you. I, I couldn't do it by myself. I mean, you know, it, it, it's not a really easy test. It wasn't for me. I mean, I, I, I shared this with a couple of y'all. I've had about eighty. 89 rounds of chemo in the last 11 years, and it's really affected my memory bad. And that was one reason I told Gary I did this, was to try to jog my memory back into use for studying and, and trying to get my memory to work in again. So, Well, Jeff, we're, we're very, 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 very proud of you, um, and uh, thank you for sharing that. Did anybody have any questions for Jeff? Yes, if I may, Gary, just one. Yes, please. Uh, Jeff, yes. uh, how were the math questions? That's what's scaring me. 
There, there wasn't, but maybe um, from what I remember, maybe two. Okay. There was only like two math questions, and I was trying to remember which two, two there it was. And if I can remember, I'll give me a few minutes, and maybe it'll come back to me. Uh, it, it really won't matter, though, because you never no, know. There's, there's not just one test. There's a, a yeah. bunch of different tests, so. Yeah, I mean, um, and it's just looking to draw what what you get, you know. Yeah. And okay. the, like I said, if you, if you if you'll just go on the AWRL website and just take those tests over and over, I, I took them quite often. I'm gonna be honest with you. And yeah. even when I was looking at possibly taking the test online, everywhere I read it said if you you're not scoring in like the high, I think. What was it, Gary? You may know the answer. Eighty percent thereabouts, yeah. Yeah, not e don't even talk. You know, they want you taking those tests and being proficient with those before you even call them. Okay. Yeah, Thank and, you. and I will be sending you, you an email with another link uh, to the uh, American Radio Relay League uh, practice site. Uh, you sign up for a free account, and um, uh, you can review by chapter, and you can also take sample tests, uh, and over and over and over again. And we will be taking sample tests here uh, in the class as a group uh, in two weeks. Uh, so um, you'll get a chance to, to get that experience as well. But it's not too early now to, to begin taking uh, sample tests. Any other questions from the group? All right, very good. Um, got to find my mouse here again. Okay, there we go. Um, so to get us started uh, tonight, I uh, just wanted to remind you uh, that uh, next week uh, we will have the last chapter in the book, the safety chapter, chapter 9, and we will also have a guest uh, in the second half of, of the uh, uh, program, uh, Robert Webster, um, if we can go over to the PowerPoint. Um, uh, Robert Webster will tell us, well, so now what? <laughs> if you get your license, where do you go from here? Uh, and uh, so uh, please uh, look forward uh, to that. And then the week after, uh, that'll be December the 9th, that will be our last uh, class session, uh, we will take uh, the uh, sample tests uh, together. So tonight we're going to be talking about Chapter 8, uh, Licensing uh, Regulations. Uh, there are six sections. Uh, we'll be taking a break uh, in the middle, but we should be here uh, only for about an hour. Uh, it'll be a, a short class again tonight because you deserve it. You've been studying hard, and so uh, you get get a chance to, to to you know get out of here a little early. And Anna in Casablanca, Morocco, you can go to bed <laughs> at yes. two, two in the morning or whatever it's going to be there for you. I'm so, so. happy for this decision. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank let's, you. <laughs> you betcha. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead and get started. Chapter 8, uh, Control Operators. So this is the uh, U.S. Amateur Radio License. This is what it looks like. Uh, and uh, you will get one of these. So you'll have to print it off yourself uh, from the FCC Universal Licensing System uh, website. And remember, it's two, two, two licenses in one. It's an operator license, so you can operate any amateur radio station. Uh, and it's also a station license. You can build uh, your own amateur radio station. And you actually get uh, this full-size version, and then you get one that you can uh, put in a wallet and, and carry with you. So um, you really will get two licenses, uh, but with s just a single call sign. So what it, um, amateur radio stations must always have is someone who is designated as the control operator. They're the person who is responsible for the transmissions from uh, an amateur radio station. Uh, and an amateur station will always have a control operator. Uh, and that control operator can be one with a US amateur radio license, or it could be a foreign uh, licensed amateur radio operator whose country has an operating agreement with the United States uh, for reciprocal operation. Uh, people from that other country can operate here, and we can operate in the other country. So uh, it can be a licensed U.S. amateur or uh, someone who is not a U.S. citizen but uh, who is operating under a reciprocal agreement. 
The control operator is responsible for station operations when the station is transmitting. The FCC doesn't care about reception. They, they care about when you're emitting radio frequency energy. And the primary thing that the control operator must be aware of is to not um, have harmful interference uh, to other services. And that's uh, defined as that which seriously degrades, obstructs, or interrupts a radio communication service operated in accordance with the radio regulations. So your transmissions should not interfere with anyone else's. Uh, and that's the control operator's primary responsibility. The control operator is assumed by the FCC to be the station licensee. Um, but the station licensee can designate someone else to be the control operator. Um, and it used to be you'd make a notation in the station log that uh, so-and-so has been designated as the control operator. Um, logs are not required anymore, um, so maybe just a note in a, in a notebook someplace or uh, even an electronic log if you're keeping one on a computer, that would be helpful. Here is an important point. Whoever is the control operator, their class of license sets the operating conditions. So let's say you, you have, you're a technician a licensee and you build a station uh, that includes uh, high frequency privileges or high frequency capabilities, uh, single sideband, let's say, but you have no privileges to operate single sideband on the 40 meter band. But if I come over to your station and you say, Gary, I'm going to designate you as the control operator, then I could operate your station on the 40 meter band, single sideband, because I'm an extra class operator. And so my um, class of license sets the operating conditions. Now we would use my call sign, not your call sign at that point in time, but I could use your station. Um, and just a, a note here that repeaters, even though the control operator may not be physically at uh, the location where the repeater is, repeaters also always have a control operator. When you do designate someone else to be the control operator of a station, that doesn't mean that you're um, carte blanche, you don't have any responsibility. It's a shared responsibility, 50-50, between whoever the control operator is and uh, the station licensee. So, let me ask this question. When can a station transmit without having a control operator? The answer is never. There's always got to be a control operator. So here's another question, and you can go ahead and unmute on this one because I'd like to hear your response. Can a technician class licensee be named the control operator of an extra class station and then proceed to operate in the extra class portion of the band? No. Negatory. No, yeah, you are correct. They cannot. Uh, so if you come to my station, and I designate you as the control operator, you could operate the station under your call sign. However, if you only have a technician class license, you would not, again, be able to operate single sideband on 40 meters. So um, that's, you got that one correct. That's good. It seems silly, but okay. The control point for a, a station is the location at which the control operator function is performed. Uh, and this only really becomes important in remote operation. Uh, if you're operating a station remotely, that remote location actually becomes the control point. So that's just a bit of definition. Oh, look, we're already up to some questions. So when is an amateur station permitted to transmit without a control operator? Go ahead and unmute and let me know. Never. never. D delta, never, correct. And who must designate the station control operator? Alpha. The station, station licensee. Yes, Alpha, the station licensee is the person who designates that, right? And what determines the transmitting privileges of an amateur station? David. The class of operator. Delta. Delta. Yeah, it's the class of operator license head by, held by whoever is designated as the control operator. So, yeah. 
And what is an amateur station control point? Charlie. Charlie. The location at which the control operator function is performed. It's kind of silly, but okay. Yep, that's it. When under normal circumstances may a technician class licensee be the control operator of a station operating, operating in an exclusive amateur extra class operator segment of the amateur bands? When can a Alpha. tech at no time can they be the control operator and operate in the extra class portion? Correct. When the control operator is not the station licensee, who is responsible for the proper operation of the station? Delta. Delta. 50-50. And who does the FCC presume to be the control operator of an amateur station unless documentation to the contrary is in the station records? Delta. Delta. Station licensee is assumed to be the control operator. Correct. Very good. All right, this is important, uh, identification. And I have to say that after I started teaching this class, my station identification had to get better because my students held me to account. <laughs> so you must identify your transmissions whenever you're transmitting every 10 minutes and at the end of a contact. So. You, at the beginning of a contact, you actually don't have to identify who you are. But within 10 minutes, you must identify using your call sign. Uh, generally, if you're using voice, you uh, do it with phonetics. So, Whiskey 4, Echo, Echo, Yankee. Um, since we are um, primarily English-speaking country, uh, we use English uh, to uh, identify ourselves. In other countries, that's, that's different. Um, Morse code, CW, is always okay for identifications. Mm -hmm. So there are some radios that actually have Morse code identifiers that you can program, and you can just push a button, and it'll send your call sign in Morse code, and that's a legitimate ID. Morse code is always allowed. You're supposed to identify even for brief transmissions without modulation. Now, if you're going to you know, check an antenna, tune it up, and you want to see what the SWR is, um, you really are supposed to throw out your call sign um, after 10 minutes uh, or when you're done uh, just so that everybody knows who was making the transmission. I'm going to be honest with you, not everyone does. You'll be listening on the bands and you'll hear random carriers come up and down without identification. That's not per the regulations. One mm -hmm. exception is, check this out. This is a radio-controlled model. <laughs> Whoa! Um, radio control for models, you do not have to uh, do an identification, either in Morse code or, or in any other way. Uh, that's the one exception about station identification. Remember, after 10 minutes and at the end of a transmission. You can use something called tactical call signs if you're volunteering uh, for a, a group effort, like maybe running a marathon, uh, and the marathon organizers have asked the Ham Radio Club to, hey, can you provide c communications at the starting line, uh, and at the midway point, and at the uh, the finish line? You could, could you put radio operators there? And, oh, this, this marathon is going to go on for like four or five hours, um, so can you change out operators like every hour? Well, in order to have some consistency, you can use a tactical call sign, and that would be like starting line, midway point. Um, so you could say, uh, midway point, midway point, here is the starting line, over. That's a tactical call sign, that's, and that's allowed. So it doesn't matter who the operator is at the particular location, as long as at the end of the transmission, you also then throw in your amateur radio call sign. This is Midway Point, where uh, uh, we've received that information. Thank you very much. Midway Point clear, Whiskey 4, Echo, Echo, Yankee. So you, you can't not use your FCC call sign, but you can use these tactical call signs in addition to uh, your uh, FCC call sign. Here's some more rules. As we mentioned, Morse code is always okay for an ID. If you're going to be on voice, the phonetic alphabet use is encouraged. It's considered to be a good practice by the FCC. 
If you hear somebody uh, with a call sign like this, W8EEY or Whiskey 8 Echo Echo Yankee Slant 4 or Stroke 4 or Slash 4, all of those words are for this character right here. This would mean that I'm given a, a call sign from 8 land, which is like up in Michigan, but I'm operating down here in the southeast in 4 land. This is just a way for me to identify my location so that people who are uh, trying to uh, communicate with me on HF, for example, will turn their antennas in the right direction. They won't turn mm -hmm. their antennas up to Michigan, they'll turn them down to the southeast. Uh, so, but this uh, the separator here is called a slant, a stroke, or a slash. You can add something called a self-assigned call sign indicator. I've never heard this, but it's okay as long as it doesn't conflict with FCC rules or international prefixes. So, Whiskey 8 Echo Echo Yankee Stroke Delighted that would be okay. I don't know what that means, but okay. But you could not say Whiskey 8 Echo Echo Yankee Stroke DL. DL is a prefix for Germany, and so you, you can't do that. So you, ha you can't conflict with the rules or international prefixes. Just be aware of that. When you upgrade your license, and you will, your first license is going to be the technician license, so the, the first uh, uh, line up here doesn't apply. But when you upgrade from technician to general, at the, when you pass your test and you get your certificate of successful completion of exam, you are a general class operator at that moment. And you can begin to operate on the general class portion of the band as long as you use this uh, additional prefix. So, um, Whiskey 8 Echo Echo Yankee stroke AG for Acting General. Or if you upgrade from General to Extra, it's AE. Now, you'll get this, as soon as your upgrade is in the database, in the Universal Licensing System database, you don't need to do this anymore. So you probably only do this for a day or two. You don't have to do it um, if you're like talking on a repeater and your technician license would have allowed you to talk on that repeater, unless you want to brag. <laughs> it's a way to tell people, hey, I passed my general, or hey, I passed my extra. More questions. We're moving right along. So what are the FCC rules regarding the use of a phonetic alphabet for station identification? Delta, it's encouraged. It is encouraged. It's considered to be a good practice. And when may an amateur station transmit without on-the-air identification? Delta. Remember that big radio control model? That's the exception. And when using tactical identifiers, such as race headquarters during a service net operation, how often must your station transmit the station's FCC-assigned call sign? Charlie. It's the same as mm -hmm. for regular transmission, after 10 minutes and at the end of a transmission. Okay. When is an amateur station required to transmit its assigned call sign? David. At the, at least every 10 minutes and at the end mm -hmm. of a communication. Mm -hmm. D is correct. Which of the following is an acceptable language to use for station identification when operating in a phone subband? single sideband. Oh, Charlie. A U.S. Uh, licensee must identify in English. So mm -hmm. what method of call sign identification is required for a station transmitting phone signals? Bravo. You can do it with either Morse code, CW, mm -hmm. or by voice. Yes. So which of the following formats of a self-assigned indicator is acceptable when identifying, identifying using a phone transmission? Read carefully. Delta. 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 Yeah, you get stroke or slant, stroke, slant, slash, all of those are correct. So which of the following is required when making on-the-air test transmissions? Alpha. You must identify using your call sign. All right. 
interference. We'll go through this and then we'll take a break. So we kind of mentioned this before. That's the control operator's primary responsibility uh, to prevent interference. That which seriously degrades, obstructs, or repeatedly interrupts a radio communication service operating in accordance with radio regulations. So if some other service is operating according to regulations and you're not, uh, you're at fault. So that's radio frequency interference. And, and there's two kinds of interference. Interference from you, that's what we were talking about. And then there's also interference to you. You could be interfered with by someone else. The most important kind of interference that we want to avoid uh, is any interference that might impact radio navigation services, um, like used for aircraft or, or for watercraft. Um, navigation services must be protected. And it's amazing the, the wide range of frequencies that are involved in some of these systems. Uh, and so here's uh, in the HF bands, um, here's some in VHF, uh, up in the UHF area. So it's rare that a properly adjusted amateur radio transceiver would have any of these uh, um, spurious outputs on, on any, of these, any of these frequencies, but you need to know about it uh, and you need to avoid that. Uh, that's uh, the control operator's responsibility. Now I mentioned there's interference from you and then there's interference to you. Well, I think we briefly mentioned this before. QRM, uh, anybody want to tell me what QRM stands for? Interference. Well, QRM is man-made interference and DQRM is deliberate man-made interference. Someone is jamming your transmission or interfering with your transmission. It's not allowed. It's not legal. Um, does it happen? Sometimes people never grow up. They stay children <laughs> all their lives. And so sometimes children play badly. Uh, and so that's what this is. Um, so I just want you to be aware that it, it can happen. Um, but uh, it's not necessarily anything that you're doing that's, that's causing this. So, oh, this is a pet peeve. You'll hear people say, You'll get on a frequency, you'll say, is the frequency in use? Is the frequency in use, please? Whiskey 4, Echo, Echo, Yankee. You'll hear nothing. You'll do it again. You hear nothing. So then you start calling CQ, CQ, CQ from Whiskey 4, Echo, Echo, Yankee, calling any station. And then somebody will come up on frequency and say, hey, we've got a net operating on this frequency in the next five minutes. Get off my frequency. No amateur radio operator owns any particular frequency. Uh, now, there are net operations that have a history of operating on particular frequencies. And if you can accommodate them, great. But they don't have an absolute right to that frequency. They can always QSY. Anybody remember what QSY stands for? Frequency. Change frequency, mm -hmm. correct. So you can QSY or they can QSY. The whole point is that common sense and courtesy should prevail. <laughs> but they say there's nothing more uncommon than common sense. Oh, mm -hmm. more questions. We're just moving right along here. When is willful interference to other amateur radio stations permitted? Boy. At no time time. Which of the following applies when two stations transmitting on the same frequency interfere with each other? Alpha. Common courtesy should prevail. No one has an absolute right to an amateur frequency. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the first half of our presentation for this evening. So let's go ahead and take five minutes and we'll be back.
And we are back. Glad to have everyone with us. We've got 13 people uh, in the Zoom classroom. And I just had the opportunity to look over in the chat, and I realize now that we had a second person uh, pass their exam on Saturday as well. Um, and he, Paul's just putting his headphones on right now. But Paul, I see that you passed on Saturday too. Uh, would you unmute and, and tell us about your experience? Yeah, it was it was pretty good. It, it it was quiet. There was three there's three uh amateur extras there giving the exam. Um and it was pretty good. Uh it, it took me about just under twenty minutes to finish the exam. And uh past it I I got ended up getting hundred percent on it. Whoa. And they, like you said, they gave, they asked me if I wanted to take the general, which I did after that. I didn't pass that. So, but I, but the, but I only knew like three questions on it, but most of it was foreign. 
Well, good, excellent. So it was, uh, it was, it was very exciting. It was, uh, it was, it was good. It was, it was a great, it was a great experience. Excellent. It was definitely worth it taking the general because at least you got an idea as to what the general is going to be like. Exactly, and uh, I have known people that have uh, studied uh, for both at the same time and have walked in with no license and walked out with the general. So. Um, that can happen, yeah. and um, but uh, very good. Congra congratulations to you. Very proud of you. Um, what is your new call sign? I don't. It has been posted yet, so ah. I I checked today. Okay. Well, let us know, please. And of course, you're welcome to come on back to the class and uh, no, finish. Yes, I will finish it out, and uh, we. Oh will yeah, no, I'm. Yeah, I'm looking forward. Thank you. I'm looking forward. Yeah, I'm going to be at every class, and I'm looking, looking forward, forward to the general, general one that you're going to have next year. Too. Correct. Yes, we'll, we'll have a general class uh, starting in March, and uh, so uh, yeah, we'll we'll keep you informed yeah. uh, about that. Great. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it uh, for that information. All right. Let's. Oh, you bet. Anytime. It was Oop, and I just muted you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Cut you off in, in mid-sentence. Okay. <laughs> no problem. All righty, good. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, finish up tonight and get us out early, and then you can go home. Oh, wait, you're already at home. <laughs> so am I. By the... and So uh, Section 8.4, Third-Party Communications. This goes back um, in history, kind of in that um, amateur radio was a way of communicating long distances uh, even to other countries uh, and it bypassed the telephone system and the telephone companies did not want to lose revenue uh, and so the posts and telecommunications services in some countries uh, would not authorize amateur radio to carry messages to third parties, to people outside the two people who were in the conversation, uh, the amateur in the United States and the amateur in another country. So that's what third party communications is all about. And so to this day, even though with the internet, I mean, we have Anna in Casablanca, Morocco on video with us here. I mean, uh, you know, technology has far surpassed these regulations, but uh, that's what third-party uh, communication is all about. So if somebody says, hey, could you pass a message to my friend in Germany? Watch out. Be careful. Go to, uh, there's a, a website, the American Radio Relay League has this uh, page that lists third-party operating agreements. You can't send that message to somebody's friend in Germany unless there's a third-party agreement uh, with Germany, and I'll tell you right now, there isn't one. So that would not be acceptable use of amateur radio. I put this in just because I love the, the uh, cartoon. Um, this is a somewhat inebriated guy with the policeman saying that I've only got, I've got third party insurance, but I've only been to two parties. Uh, no, 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 that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about communications, uh, and only if allowed by the governments of the countries involved. Holy smokes, we're already up to questions. Which of the following restrictions apply when a non-licensed person is allowed to speak to a foreign station using a station under the control of a technician class control operator? Boy. The foreign station must be one with which the United States has a third party agreement because that other person talking is a third party. Now, can you have another person talking on communications within the United States from state to state or from, you know, yes, that's no problem. You, you can do that here in the United States. It's just internationally, that's the, the issue. To which foreign stations do the FCC rules authorize the transmission of non-emergency third-party communications. Alpha. It's only when there's an agreement in place between the two countries. Remember the posts and telecommunications people were trying to protect their revenue. <laughs> that's, that's long ago history, but these rules still exist. And what is meant by third-party communications?
Alpha. It's a message from a control operator to another amateur station control operator on behalf of another person. That's the third party, is the another person. All right, remote and automatic operation. And we'll have a little story here uh, in this section. So automatic control is what is used by repeaters, radio repeater systems. Remember I said that radio repeaters had to have a control operator, but the control operator didn't necessarily have to be where the transmitter is located. That's because repeaters and digipeaters use something called automatic control. And automatic control uh, is, uses devices and procedures that ensure compliance with FCC rules. So this is a repeater controller box, so there's different flavors of them, and this is designed to, you know, if the transmitter has a problem, it'll take the transmitter off the air. Uh, that's an uh, automated uh, device. Uh, and procedures, uh, if the transmitter stays locked on for more than 10 minutes or five minutes, uh, then a watchdog timer will take the transmitter off the air. So devices and procedures, that's called automatic control, uh, and uh, repeaters use automatic control. Remote control, this is a, a relatively um, new popular innovation, although hams have been actually controlling their stations remotely for a long time over separate radio links, but with the internet and uh, the advent of um, high-speed networks, you can actually have um, your front end of your radio connect into a little box that connects to the internet that connects to the other side of your radio um, and your power amplifier and maybe your rotor control and you can operate your station remotely over the internet. Uh, and so it doesn't matter if you're in the next room or in the next county, or even in another country, you can operate your station uh, remotely. And my friend uh, Matt, uh, US call sign NU4E, uh, but German call sign Delta Lima 8 Oscar Golf, can sit in his apartment here in Greenville, South Carolina, and operate his amateur radio station in the area of Frankfurt, Germany, uh, over the internet. That's kind of cool. And some radios are designed with just this in mind. So this is my radio. You notice that the front panel of the radio that there's no frequency readout? There's no knobs. This is what they call a radio server. It's designed to be connected to a local area network and in turn to the internet and you can access this radio from anywhere uh, using you know, an internet or, or TCP IP uh, type connection. So this is the point in the program where I'm supposed to make a demonstration and show you my station on the air. But um, uh, Doug, if you'll come to me on the camera, here's the story. So good news and bad news. The good news is that I have new internet uh, capabilities here. I live out in the country, miles away from anywhere, and I was very fortunate to have uh, DSL service from AT&T, American Telephone and Telegraph. Uh, but DSL is pretty slow. Uh, it's about six megabits per second uh, download and one megabit per second upload. That was not fast enough to stream these video conferences to, uh, to YouTube. So what we'd been using was a, a 4G hotspot uh, to do that. Well, AT&T has something they call fixed wireless internet. And it was made available in my area. So I signed up for it. And we are using this new AT&T fixed wireless internet right now. Uh, we're streaming this program to YouTube, and the Zoom meeting is being held on this new internet. Well, radio servers uh, and computer-controlled radios uh, are good unless you make a change to your network and you realize at the last minute, oh, wait a minute, I have to change some settings in my router in order to make this work. 
I discovered that this afternoon. It had worked last week when I did the, the presentation update and uh, tested things out, but that was under the old system. So I owe you a demonstration of my HF radio, and we may do that next week once I get things tweaked uh, and back up and operating again. So that's remote operation almost. So we talked about the control point. Let's go back to the presentation. Remember the control point is the location where the control function takes place. So if you're remotely controlling a, a radio, where you are as the control operator, that is the control point. And it's defined as local control, even though you're not sitting right there next to the radio directly manipulating the controls. You're rather indirectly manipulating them using a computer or some other method. And radio repeaters, um, we, I think we mentioned this once before, but if someone uh, makes a transmission through a radio repeater using obscenity or something that is prohibited in FCC regulations, the repeater control operator is not responsible for that. Rather, the originating station, the station who transmitted into the repeater, that control operator is responsible and would be cited by the FCC. Oh, more questions. So which of the following is an example of automatic control? Go ahead and unmute. David? Alpha. Automatic control is using devices and procedures so that the control operator doesn't need to be there. That's repeater operation. Repeater operation uses automatic control. And which of the following is true of remote control operation? A. Read, Delta. Care read carefully. Alpha. It, alpha is correct. Bravo is correct. Charlie is correct. Oh. <laughs> All of okay. those choices are correct. Okay. Yep. Which of the following is an example of remote control as defined in Part 97, the amateur radio regulations? Yeah, I guess you're right. Bravo. Operating a station over the internet is an example of remote control. Internet. And who is accountable should a repeater inadvertently retransmit communications that violate FCC rules? Adam. The originating station, the control mm -hmm. operator of the originating station. All right, last section for tonight. Prohibited communications. So normally it's prohibited for amateur radio operators to communicate with any other uh, class of service. The exception would be uh, an emergency, uh, where there's uh, life or uh, protection of property involved. It's also prohibited for amateur radio operators to communicate with US military stations, except uh, on Armed Forces Day which is the third Saturday in May, and it's pre-announced, the military stations will listen on frequencies that they use, and amateur stations will transmit on frequencies that they're allocated, and amateur stations can communicate with military stations on Armed Forces Day. So this is an exception uh, to a general prohibition. We said that you can't um, uh, have a pecuniary interest. You can't transmit um, amateur radio uh, for money. You can't for hire. Well, you can, however, sell amateur radio equipment. Uh, radios, antennas, cable, computers, anything that might uh, normally be used in an amateur radio station, you can offer for sale using amateur radio. That's not considered a pecuniary interest in, in that regard. Um, and even here in uh, the South Carolina area on our Caesars Head Repeater on Wednesday nights, they have a regular swap and shop uh, where people will list items for sale or items they want to buy. So it's a way for people to, to be able to find things that they need. Obscenity, we mentioned that, that's um, not allowed. 
uh, more than George Carlin's uh, seven words. Uh, just use common sense and, and decency, please. That it's not allowed. Retransmission of other signals is prohibited, with the exception of space stations, auxiliary stations, and repeaters can repeat other amateur radio stations. In fact, that's a repeater's job, is to repeat amateur radio signals. You cannot operate for money. There's the pecuniary interest. The exception, though, is when it's incidental to an educational activity. Think of a high school science teacher, for example, who has an amateur radio station in their class. They're getting paid by the school, but they're not getting paid for their amateur radio transmissions. So um, you can't operate for money unless it's incidental to an educational activity. Music is prohibited. So if you're in the car with a mobile station and you have the radio on and it's playing music, the best practice is to turn the radio station off, to turn the, the car radio off so that you're not retransmitting music. There is an exception in the case of manned spacecraft activities. Boy, this goes back a long ways. Uh, mission Control at NASA used to wake the astronauts up uh, in the Mercury, Gemini, uh, and Apollo programs with music. So, uh, and amateur radio stations were allowed by NASA to rebroadcast Mission Control. Uh, so sometimes music would come out from Mission Control. So that was an exception that was allowed. Otherwise, you can't transmit music on amateur radio frequencies. And you can't use codes and ciphers that um, obscure the meaning of a transmission unless you're controlling a radio-controlled model or controlling a space station, a satellite. Then you can use codes and ciphers uh, to encrypt control commands because you don't want just anybody you know, taking over your, your satellite or taking over uh, a radio controlled model. News gathering is prohibited except when life or property, an emergency, is at stake. Then you can assist news stations in news, news gathering, but that's a very rare exception. And broadcasting, you, gen you can't broadcast to the general public. That's not allowed, except if you're doing Morse code practice or information bulletins related to amateur radio. So here is um, the American Radio Relay League station in Newington, Connecticut, W1AW. They have a daily uh, schedule of Morse code practice, and there's... Lots of people listening uh, to those uh, transmissions, uh, but there's no one transmitting back to them. Uh, so that's a one-way, you could say, broadcast, but it's allowed because it's code practice. More rules. You can't use amateur radio as a substitute for communi uh, commercial communications channels um, because the Post and Telecommunications folks want to get their revenue. <laughs> Now, again, the Internet has largely superseded this, uh, but this is uh, still the rule. You can't substitute for commercial uh, communications channels. Last set of questions. So under which of the following circumstances may an amateur radio station make a one-way transmission? Go ahead and unmute. Adam. Bravo. Bravo. When you're transmitting code practice or information bulletins or those necessary to provide emergency communications. So uh, there are these exceptions. When is it permissible to transmit messages encoded to hide their meaning? Charlie. C. Yep, if you're controlling a space station or a satellite, or if you have a radio-controlled craft, you don't want somebody else taking control, so then it's allowed. Under what conditions is an amateur station authorized to transmit music? Alpha. Alpha. When NASA Mission Control transmits music and you have permission to rebroadcast them, then that's the one exception. When may amateur radio operators use their stations to notify other amateurs of the availability of equipment for sale? Alpha. 
Oh, when yeah. it's used in an amateur station and such activity is not conducted on a regular basis. It's not your, your business. What, mm -hmm. if any, are the restrictions concerning transmission of language that may be considered indecent or obscene? Bravo. Bravo. Any, any such language is prohibited. What types of amateur stations can automatically retransmit the signals of other amateur stations? Bravo. So a repeater is certainly one of those. And then we said the other two are auxiliary or space stations. Those are the three. In which of the following circumstances may the control operator of an amateur station receive compensation? Bravo. Bravo. Incidental to classroom education. And under which of the following circumstances are amateur stations authorized to transmit signals related to broadcasting, program production, or news gathering? Alpha. Alpha. Only when it's an emergency, when there's a life or safety of property, then you can do that. And what is the meaning of the term broadcasting in the rules for the amateur radio service? D. General public. Transmissions intended for the reception by the general public. Smile. You made it through Chapter 8. Congratulations. Very proud of you. You were, were very responsive uh, to the questions. Are there any questions before we close out tonight from anyone? I don't hear anything. Okay, good. So next week, Chapter 9. Oh, yes, Anna, go ahead. Anna, go ahead. Uh, I just want to ask you, can you send us can you send us the link of the exams in the ARRL? Yes, I will send so you we can the, just the give it to try. Yes, absolutely. I will send you the link to uh, the app spot, what they call it, um, uh, website where you can actually um, take practice tests. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Be happy to do that. Um, that'll be Thank in the, the email that I will send out tomorrow morning. Anyone else? Jeff? Yeah? Back up, back up a few chapters real quick. Sure. But when we're talking about the, all the different bands that we can uh, transmit on as amateurs, uh, 10 meter band, we can't, we can't transmit as a, as a tech on 10 meter band, can we? Yes, you can. 10 meters is the exception. Uh, you're allowed to do voice transmissions, data transmissions, Morse code transmissions on a certain segment of the 10 meter band. It's not the entire 10 meter band, but you do have okay. provisions in, in the 10 meter band. That's the exception. I kept trying to figure that out because it said above 50 megahertz, and that's what I couldn't. Well, above 50 megahertz, you've got full privileges. VHF and above, you can, you can with a technician license, there are no restrictions. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll figure it out later. Okay, cool. All right, so next week we'll do Chapter 9, Safety. Uh, really one of the more important chapters because we do some things in amateur radio. We work on towers up high. We work with high-voltage equipment. Uh, we sometimes are involved using chemicals and other things. So safety is important. And just the transmission of radio frequency energy, we need to understand more about that. Um, a, there's a lot of fear, uh, somewhat unfounded, uh, about radio frequency energy, uh, radiation. We're, we'll talk about that next week. Uh, and that'll take the, the first uh, half of the, the class. And then we'll have our special presentation. So now what? After you get your license, what are you going to do next? Uh, Robert Webster will be with us to, to, to share that information. Thank you all for joining us uh, here in the Zoom classroom. And for those who are watching on YouTube, thank you very much. Uh, we'll have uh, links uh, to handouts uh, for this class, uh, for this uh, video, uh, in the description box on YouTube uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, this is uh, November 25th, 2020, uh, th the day before Thanksgiving here in the United States. Thank you all for watching. 73, we'll see you next week. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody.